Thanks. Um, I first of all should start out uh, with a disclaimer that I'm not going to be telling anyone anything price sensitive or in fact anything at all tonight that was going to be of value to anybody. Um, and yeah, I, I'm doing this as a way of, um, you know, stopping people asking me, how's your Kaolin project going? Um, because that's generally what people assume about lakes. Um, I'd also like to add to the welcome to country that um, player one, which is uh, me and a few of my mates, uh, and impact, which is uh, Dr. Mike Jones and, and Martin down in the front here, we are operating on Naju land and in a couple of tenements um, in the yes, Prince Noongar country. And we are there as guests and we everything we do is to in benefit to the shareholders of Impact Minerals, myself, and to the people um, of the land. Um, <clears throat> so for tonight, I'll have a brief review of alienite and um, phosphate minerals. And we'll stick mostly to the alienites, obviously. Um, I'll describe what evaporative alunite is and delve into my appreciation of the uh, evaporitic alunite mineral system. And then I'll go into some of the processes that led to the project generation, uh, metallurgy, um, and then the, what, the economic geology of the whole thing in no particular reference to any market information. Um, some, you know, basic plain truths, I guess, about the alienite. Um, so starting off with, um, this is from John Dill, who had a textbook on this um, that I have only skimmed through. Um, alienite, phosphate, sulfate minerals are a, a group of about 450 minerals, um, a very few of which are listed up here. Um, they're generally low temperature and low pressure hydrous uh, minerals. Um, there's typically secondary minerals um, from weathering of aluminium, sulphur, iron and phosphorus rich primary mineralogy. Um, and, they, and alunite in particular forms an incomplete solid solution uh, with uh, jarosite uh, and there's an iron and potassium miscibility gap there. Um, so they tend to occur together, but they're formed from different processes. Um, and also for alunite, uh, you can substitute potassium for sodium, ammonia, hydronium, which is water, um, and you also substitute al aluminium for iron uh, in a limited fashion. Um, <clears throat> and there's a, a list of um, alunite group minerals on the left here, jarosite included, natro alunite, there's also natro jarosite, uh, potash alunite, which is generally what I've been dealing with. Ammonia alunite, which uh, is generally a higher temp the highest temperature um, phase of it, and hydronium alunite, which uh, is very rare in nature. Um, and also there are alunites with lead, arsenic, and chrome substitution. Um, and this has becomes critical for the metallurgy and why we're avoiding most of your typical alunites. For the phosphate group, um, there are there is a substitution of aluminium for phosphate, so you do get some partial inclusion of crandallites um, in alunites, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then you've got all of your sort of um, other sulfate minerals over here, which uh, may be present, but are generally hard to find on XRD because they're quite poorly ordered. Uh, so yeah, we'll stick to this alunite to, tonight and leave the phosphates for someone who knows about it. Um, there are four facies of um, APS minerals. Uh, petagenic, uh, which is in calcrete and soils, uh, and also phosphate nodules, you do um, see them there. Saprolytic alunite uh, can be from the weathering of sulfitic felsic rocks, generally felsic, um, sulfitic shales and sediments, and also phosphatic rocks, including carbonatites um, and glauconites. Um, most alunite, however, are, is found in the upper parts of high sulfidation felsic magmatic okay, porphyry systems. Um, you also can get prograde um, metamorphic versions of these up to about 200, 300 degrees. Um, you, you can also get um, alteration of um, phosphates to in rare earth bearing carbonatites to fluorinsite, gorsosite, et cetera. So that's kind of gives you an idea, uh, just a very basic overview. 
uh, a typical alunite deposit with a cross section here. Uh, it was below the uh, quartz litho cap um, in these sort of areas where you, you, your high temperature um, fluids come up, the structures, and they start to replace the felsic posts. Uh, they're best developed in uh, andesite, caldera, andesite and felsic calderas along the bounding structures. Um, and the hydrothermal alunite forms from low pH, high temperature, um, chlorine sulfate rich um, fluids at around about 150 to about 320 degrees. Um, most of them are natural alunites, so sodium dominant alunites. Um, and most of them, you know, tend to form around about here. They do form at a lower temperature occasionally. Uh, this is the giant in the room, Fanshan in China. Uh, two, sorry, it's a bit small, but 2.8 gigatons, 50% alunite. Uh, there's porophyllite, quartz, kaolin, and topaz. Here's a um, SEM of a slab of core, the pink being the alunite and the purple being the quartz. Uh, it's crystalline um, formed from alteration of tuffs. So that's generally what you think about alunite. However, uh, we're talking about evaporitic alunite and its mineral system, which is completely different. Um, and the too long didn't read it summary is that lacustrine alunite is formed via spray drift carrying marine solutes into inland drainage systems where evaporation and water sediment interactions form acidic groundwaters and in small lakes adjacent and marginal to the regionally large sumps, alunite precipitates as a neoformed evaporitic salt. So this is a salt ore body. It's not a clay. But it looks like a clay. It quacks like a clay, but it's not a clay. So it's a salt. Um, in terms of the climatology, um, we have, I just learned how to run um, PowerPoint for this so you can enjoy the animations. Um, so westerly spray drift brings marine aerosols. Uh, and on the top right, we've got a, you know, most of your marine aerosol is sodium and chlorine. Importantly though, 7.8% of the 3.5% um, in seawater is sulfate and there's some magnesium, calcium, a tiny bit of potassium and other stuff. Uh, so that over the course of millions of years is blown west via the Antarctic circulation uh, into inland Australia. Uh, the larger map here is the um, from the CSIRO hydrogeochemistry I've averaged out with some artistic license, I must say, because the gridding falls apart. But this is the Colours in the polygons is the average um, pH of the groundwater system and uh, the dots are the uh, individual uh, bores which were in the hydrogeochem database uh, and the pink hexagons here are the known alunite bearing lakes. Uh, so you can see that there are, there's a very strong correlation between acidic groundwaters and alunite in lakes. Um, and it's not just in the individual potentially economic lakes, but this is just a, a lot of alunite forms in these areas. Um, so the marine aerosol, primarily sulfate comes in, evaporation takes hold, salinity increases, cold winters favour pedogenic calcrete formation. So this operates below the Menzies line. Um, I haven't seen anything above the Menzies line in, interesting in terms of alunite. Um, respectivity. People send me data and I, I'm not interested in it. Um, Phorolysis in the sediments in the aquifers uh, also assists in driving it to an acid pH and then alunite forms. And I'll go into this in a bit more detail. Um, so CSIRO, um, George and Lil Crap in 2006, I think it was, they did a, a comprehensive study of acidification of the groundwaters. And their assessment, and I would agree with this, is that the pedogenic carbonate by removal of carbon, carbon calcium carbonate from the groundwater drives um, the, acidity, the primary acidity in the soil. It creates ferro-oxalates, which then oxidises to girthite. 
um, which drives the pH down. The acidic groundwater is formed below the girthitic ferrocrete zone. Um, the, sol the pH goes down, so your solubility of aluminium and silica goes up. The, and on the outflow zone, the hydrosilicic acid is less soluble than the sulfate, so it destabilizes first, forming a silcrete, um, usually subjacent and within the um, discharge zone. And then distal to that, the alunite comes out later. And so there's a distinct sequence, and you can see this in the field, calcrete, iron laterite, silcrete, and saprolite below it, and, and somewhere in there is the alunite. And it, it's actually a large, well, small but very important part of a large amount of the soil mass around these salt lakes. It will be some form of alunite, um, a percent or two, but we have an assay for it. I'll, I'll get into the into lack of data at the end of this. But um, so one question I've got is like, I, I was a lot of the deep saprolite profiles in the southwest Yulgarn a consequence of this system operating. Is it a lot? Is the acidity due to the salt water flux and the acidification, and then does that knock out your saprolite? It's a good question. Um, in terms of the brine evolution. Uh, uh, Murnar et al. in 2013 did a great study, mostly aimed at the brine uh, sulfate of potash. Um, again, they didn't study alunite. There's a paragraph in there. Um, so typically, uh, continental brines uh, start with the inflow. They then go down the trouser leg of um of fate, either you form magnesium salts and at high pH and you form your natron trona um, alkaline brines. Uh, you can form sulfate brines and these are the um, targets for your salt lake potash guys. Or they can, or if gypsum comes out, you end up down with calcium rich brines. Uh, none of these are involved in the genesis of alunite uh, in particular. Um, so the best model for the alunite uh, mineral system is from MacArthur et al. back in 1989, um, and it, this fits the direct observations. He, they, um, around about the mid-80s or so, there's a few papers out um, about ferro-oxidation to drive uh, low pH. Um, MacArthur and, and friends... Uh, identify the calcrete accumulation in the fringes of salt lakes. There's a huge amount of calcrete um, bearing soils mapped west of Lake Cowan, for, for instance. And they also um, study the strontium isotopes and, and they're more or less coincident with modern seawater. Um, and it's a pretty simple system. So on the bottom here, I've this is my model uh, after MacArthur. Um, he, he had problems, um, well, they had problems um, in identifying where the alunite was, number one, um, and then number two, where the magnesium ended up. Um, so this is uh, from MacArthur's paper. Um, we've got calcium on the bottom, on the x-axis, and sulfur on the y-axis, um, starting at marine sulfate, oh, sorry, marine solute, down there, evaporation drives it up along that line, seawater line. Uh, calcrete formation depletes calcium and, and sends it that way. And then alunite formation sends it, it reduces the sulfate. And these are, the, these are from his paper in 1989, the co compositions of uh, bore waters around some of the salt lakes. Um, so the, the fact is that most of the um, sodium and chlorine ratios in the uh, major salt lakes are on the sodium chloride evaporation line, but the calcium and the sulfate differ. So it, it is seawater, but it's being modified. The strontium isotopes are within 5% basement strontium addition. So there is some um, interaction with the sediments in the aquifers. Um, so gypsum drives calcium and sulfate depletion and alunite drives sulfate depletion and a slight de deviation in um, sulfur isotopes, um, which is to be expected from uh, a mineral form. So in my opinion, 
the um, alienite brine evolution follows a path of calc calcite out in the soils and forms alienite and then forms gypsum. And the residual brine is enriched in sodium, magnesium, sulfate, um, and a lot more magnesium than, for instance, the other sulfate brines over here. Um, and one of the one of the things I've, I've I've been told, at least, is that there's quite a lot of um, sepialite and uh, smectite nontronites in Lake Cowan, et cetera, et cetera. So there's quite a lot of magnesium silicates in the salt, uh, in, in the sediments in these large systems. Um, and it's been um, assigned to the fact that they're all within the greenstone belts. That may not necessarily be the case, given that the magnesium is a residual in the brines after you've taken the alienite out. Um, so onto the, the evidence for, for all of this pontification. Um, so this is the geolog geology of Lake Hope, um, ignoring the basement, which is all granite. Um, it's a sheet of alienite, silica, kaolin, um, evaporite, it's between, say, 0.8 and 1.5 metres thick on average, maximum of 2.8 metres, 2.1 square k's. It's formed on either exposed bedrock or some longitudinal glacial dunes as the immediate footwall, so it's an evaporite. It's not an alteration product of uh, the sediments. <coughs> um, it's the, the alienite lakes um, live in a deep sump below the ground surface around it, about nine to 15 metres below the surrounding dunes, um, which is quite interesting. Um, they, and again, they're small lakes at the inflow zones of the larger lakes. Um, it actually has a fairly limited drainage hinterland. Um, they've got a strong potassium response, as you would expect. Um, and they're gypsum free. And this is an important piece of evidence for the alienite out before the gypsum out is that there's no gypsum associated with these salt lakes. So the, the calcium sulfate that's left after you take out your alienite has all gone out into this lake out here. Um, the, you can see some of this evidence in the aster. Um, first of all, there's moderate quartz silica responses. Um, proximal to these lakes. Um, the, the larger lakes are silica, gypsum, kaolin, and, and halite. And so there's no, not much of a halite signature. So there's not a lot of salt crystal in the actual lake surface. And these are exposed at surface. Um, and the opaque channel shows the laterites on the hilltops and also the, the halite um, in the major salt lakes. So, uh, and it's d difficult to sort of display it on a map, but there are, around here that you can find not cow creek nodules and a few cow creek exposures where the road cuts them in, uh, in the hint hinterland here. Uh, and some of the lakes up this drainage channel are kaolinite. Um, obviously there's alienite. In terms of the ferrous and ferric iron responses, and the ferrous sits further up into the drainage channel and the ferric is generally um, in the some of the um, lower down reaches of the um, drainage basins, fitting the model of a uh, ferrous um, and, and acidification um, route. Uh, the, this is the ternary radiometrics. Um, you can see your kaolinite and your alienite uh, in there. You've got your thorium rich laterites. It's also interesting that the uh, black signatures here are um, some of the uh, glacial dune systems. And these control the shape of some of these lakes. Um, you can see on, on the sort of northwestern strike that it truncates the larger lakes. And so the Lake Hope alienite sits in the swale of a uh, one of these older glacial dunes. Um, so in terms of the hydrography, um, oh, this is a very cartoony kind of uh, depiction of the two major 
drainages here. Um, in the south, which is the one with the most direct connection, it's about 90 square kilometres of um, drainage hinterland, and the one on the west is about 190 square kilometres. Um, <coughs> Which is it, and the, the two aren't necessarily connected. There's um, about nine or 10 metres of topographic relief between the Kaolinitic Lake here and the Alunite Lakes, uh, but subsurface, they're probably connected. So it depends on, on how you want to sort of look at it. It's either 190 or, or 200 and something square k's of, um, of catchment provides the uh, all of the solutes that, fl that formed the alienite. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, a mineral system, I, was, I had a, a crack at sort of looking at what would be the important, uh, the not very important and the not very relevant parts of the whole system from the ocean through to the salt lake. Um, I think obviously the oceanic solutes are important. The cold winters are very important because they create the um, conditions for the cow creek formation net evaporation, obviously, and, and it has to be a, a, an endorheic basin, otherwise everything flows out to the ocean. Uh, but that's a camp, so camp scale controls, um, large, you know, edges of a large salt lake, yes, it has to be continental. Um, Aeolian deposits are, are associated with these and that might be that might, um, due to the ice ages, et cetera. Um, Actually, the, the size of the catchment I don't think is quite is very important, neither is the length of the paleo channel. Um, you know, the, the paleo channel, well, there isn't really a paleo channel at Lake Hope, it's sitting on granite, right? So, um, and they, they, other examples are sitting on different sediments as well. Um, but it's also in the prospect scale, I've highlighted the ablation of gypsum as important. Um, and also for an economic point of view, because you need to get the calcium out in order to make high purity alumina. So the gypsum seems to blow off the top once you form a crystal and it, it goes away. Uh, so it's not only the alienite mineral system, this is a, a larger mineral system from marine solute, which is evaporated and concentrated into acidic groundwater and some primary evaporites, which is salt, and the brines, which form some brine resources. The acidic groundwater has an interaction with, this, uh, with the rocks to provide the alumina for the alienite, which doesn't come from the ocean. Uh, then that forms its own evaporites and brines, which can be magnesium enriched, um, and also forms the aeolian gypsum, which we see um, around Lake Cowan and, and various other places. And, in, and the acidic groundwater, I, I believe anyway, promotes saprophytization, which is important for our clay rare earth deposits down around Munglenup area, making actual kaolinite. And also the acidic ground and oxidized fluids will help move uranium around and form roll front uranium. So, uh, you know, this is a, a large mineral system that is impinging on the, the southern quarter of Western Australia. Um, and and even into South Australia, potentially. Um, and it's got a, a bunch of effects. And, you know, I'm talking about one mineral, but there's a couple of other minerals with that form. Um, you know, the salt at Lake Deborah, for instance, 150,000 tonnes per annum of salt is coming out of Lake Deborah. That's coming from the ocean, effectively. Um, now, how old is Lake Hope is a very interesting question. Uh, there have been a few potassium argon dates on a couple of alunites and they're in the sort of 15,000 year old range. But I believe these, these are much older. Um, MacArthur it all had a crack at this and, and they believe 50% of the brine, the, the solute sulfate entered alunite and the other 50% went on to form the gypsum. Um, but if we take oh, the 90 square k's or 190 square k's is the size of the alunite and we figure out how much solutes are in seawater, it would take 15, seven and 15 metres of seawater in those catchments to form the sulphur for the alunite. It's about 12 to 26 kilometres of rainfall at 300 millimetres of rainfall per annum. And assuming 100% of it ended up at Lake Hope, you've got 30 to 60,000 years. 
So it's, it's within the range of the potassium argon dating, but, I, you know, that's 100% efficiency. So, I, I you know, pick a number. Um, we have found a tectite, which could be an australite tectite at 800 KA. It was sitting on Lake Hope and one of the Indigenous ladies on the heritage survey picked it up and, and took it uh, as is, you know, her right to do that, uh, but that you know we did find one, so it could be a million years old. It could, um, in terms of where when do we think that formed? Probably during an ice age when we had the longitudinal dunes that the alienite sitting on top of, and the you know 120 to 180 thousand. I don't know what these glaciations are called. I, I haven't got that sophisticated about that. Um, or uh, 250 to 300,000 year old or even older. Um, that's the best we've got so far. Um, but it's a long lived system is I guess the simple answer there. Um, now onto the exploration, uh, the interesting um, part for the economic geologists. Um, well, that's where it is, I suppose. Uh, at some point you have to tell people where the project is. Um, normally at the front, but <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so my business strategy um, was to make HPA, which is worth twenty-five to forty-five thousand US dollars a ton. So the the the, the eye on the prize, obviously. Um, any highly luminous material has a high notional value, and you see people going off and doing um, anorthosites, for instance. Um, but you have to make HPA. So my business strategy um, for the Lacustrine alienite re recognized it's a sulfate, not a silicate. So it's more soluble in inverted, and that's in big inverted commas. It's more soluble than silicates, but it is actually higher grade than granite kaolin at 25 to 28%. You'll see people saying, Oh, I've got kaolin 39% alumina. Well, that's after you've got the, the quartz out from the granite and you've made yourself a, a, a concentrate. This is 25 to 28% at Lake Hope in situ, sitting there at surface. Uh, it's really, you know, low iron, I, I say that in qualified terms. Um, magnesium's low, calcium's very low, no manganese at all. I think I've got one assay above detection limit um, and also low phosphorus. So these are some of the um, major contaminants for making HPA apart from the sulfur and the soluble salt, but salt soluble, so it, you wash it out. Um, the grain size is less than a micron. It's actually 40 to 300 nanometers. Um, so that creates different kinetics, completely different kinetics. Um, and and I'll, I've got some SEM, later. I'll show you later for that. Um, also, it's sitting at servers, there's no strip ratio. Uh, it's unconsolidated. There's no crushing, no grinding, no blasting. So all there, there's a lot of factors we're in favor of chasing the lake. Alienite, um, and then the the favours against it was no one had ever done it before. But you know, ignorance is is bliss. Um, but you know, th this is your typical kind of ASX play. Someone find someone else finds something, and you peg it next door, and I've done that. Guilty. Um, you then explore it, and you find a resource. You then do your metallurgy. I mean, I suppose you have to do that to do that. On the ASX, but you know, generally, all most of your actual metallurgy occurs after your inferred resource, and then you do a feasibility study and you make money. Here, I was like, why don't we turn mud into LED light bulbs in 2019? And then we realised, you know, this is a metallurgical project, so we did the metallurgy first, we explored, then we picked up the tenure because that's expensive, and then the resource drilling was mostly done before we. We, we got involved with impact um, and now we're in this phase here in feasibility. So yeah, the, the metallurg so metallurgy first, exploration second, tenure third. Um, and, and I figured, yeah, if I can't find this stuff, I'll, I'll quit. Right? I'm an exploration geologist uh, and I then unfortunately turned into a, a quasi metallurgist. Um, <clears throat> so we took some samples Two and a half years in the lab before HBA. It cost us $64,000 of metallurgy before we cracked it, which is, you know, pretty good. We've got one patent and another's pending. Um, 
And this was the discovery sample. I took a photo of it. Um, and yeah, note how dry it is. They're salt lakes, but it is a salt, not a, a mud. And, and I constantly, people are like, oh, you'll just lose your equipment. You'll lose yourself in the mud because they, they walk out on Lake Cowan and it's just sloppy. And I've walked out on Lake Cowan and it is sloppy, but this is different. So we did the metallurgy first because we need to make the HPA or we don't have anything to sell. We don't, we've got some mud in the lake. Um, so it, it requires an R&D mindset. And this is where I've got to give um, a big shout out to Mike and Impact is because they're very inquisitive and very science oriented people. And that's one of the reasons that we went with Impact. Um, we've got two patents lodged for two processes maybe more to come, we'll see. Um, but we do have a, a competitive edge. I, I reckon we're probably three years ahead of our competitors and it also is a leverage to something else. So that was the kind of idea that we were running with. Um, in terms of the metallurgy of alienite, the traditional processes, uh, reductive pyrology, so burning it with fuel oil or coal. Um, you produce sulfate of potash and, and acid and from the flue gas at 650 to 850 degrees. Calcination is also an option. Um, calcination in air, um, you produce SOP, a little bit of sulfuric acid and alumina as waste products, 650 to 850 degrees. Uh, you can try and recover the alumina from the waste products with bale leach by slapping that back on the end, but you're doing that plus bale leach, so yeah, it, it struggles. Um, but also none of those are, are particularly suitable for HPA processes because you cook your alumina into corundum at a, a, an, an high ordered gamma alumina at 850 and then you've got to somehow dissolve that again and then go through everything. Right? So it, even as late as 2022, um, there's papers coming out saying alienite cannot be dissolved in acid without calcination over 575 degrees. All right, so after having done it, I was reading about how we can't do it, which is, is great. And the photos here is the Chandler Potash Works at Lake Campion near, um, near Meriden in 1947, uh, which was put into production during the war because the Russian supplies were cut off um, eerily similar to today. Um, and they mined the um, alienite at uh, Lake Campion uh, with a reductive pyrometallurgical process to make SOP for the local farms. So in terms of the kinetics um, and my, uh, yeah, my uh, um, animations have failed me here, but anyway, um, on the top is um, a TGA, thermogravimetric analysis um, of the Fanshan alienite. And on the bottom is an example of lacustrine alienite. Um, in both cases, both minerals, um, water starts to, to volatilizing at about 80 degrees up to about 450. Chlorine comes out at about 600. Um, there's a lot more chlorine in the lake alienite. Um, and fluorine comes out over 750, um, up to 900 degrees. Um, one of the interesting things, though, is that there's a greater mass change from the lacustrine alienite than the fanshan alienite. Uh, and the, de the dehydroxylation occurs at a lower temperature and desulfuration at the same temperature. Um, so here the particle size of the lacustrine alienite is providing direct kinetic advantages, bearing in mind that, th that we are not using calcination to make our alienite. Um, we're using the, what we call the sulfate process um, and it, the, from end to end it's dig it up from the lake, truck it to Quinana, uh, wash out the salt, although we're looking into not having to wash that salt out, uh, roasting it in acid, precipitating an aluminium salt and this is a bit of a um, super secret source so I won't de delve too deeply into that, purification with hydrochloric acid, um, which is common knowledge by now, calcination of the um, aluminium hexachlorohydrate into HPA. Um, so 
one of the things is the recovery is about 80 percent subject to um, further you know validation test work etc it's low temperature roasting below 250 degrees I won't say exactly how low we can go but it's below 250. Um, we can get rid of the iron, calcium, and sodium quite easily. We've made purity in the alumina of 99.993 um, via this method, um, which is the target purity, and we're obviously working on doing um, better than that. Um, one, one of the interesting things here is that there's a high material usage of the alunite. The al alumina, 25%, 5.8% potassium Oxide goes to a fertilizer product, sulfur goes to a fertilizer product. So we're using 60, 70% of the mass of the alunite that we truck to Quinana. Then the silicates, the plan at the moment is to backhaul them and dispose of them on site. So it's, it's materially efficient compared to a lot of other things. Um, and the water is also. An interesting thing to think about is that there's about 23% water in the alunite, which is contained moisture plus also water of crystallization. Water in a metallurgical process is actually a benefit, not necessarily a problem. So I look at the water as a bonus. The uh, second process is the infamous um, low temperature leach process, which we were going to call the slow cooker method, um, where I found a new uh, researched up some potential new ways of doing things. Uh, and here, I, I'm not going to mention anything much at all. Um, but, uh, yeah, the slow cooker has uh, passed on uh, from these um, activities. Um, but, yeah, take the mud, add the secret sauce, filter it out to make the PLS in a, a Coke bottle, uh, filter it out and... In, in, uh, and then you can make, here's the um, filter paper full of the uh, alumina salt. Um, you can do that in your kitchen. So one of the things that we're looking at is this process is um, it's much lower temperature. It's below 100 degrees. Um, it's, got a, it's got a very good um, value utilisation of the reagents um, and also... It's, much, it's actually simpler than the sulfate process, which was already quite simple. So, um, yeah, hopefully that'll work out. Um, and we've, we've uh, previously released that we have made HPA from this. Um, so, yeah, our, our expiration, once we had done some of the metallurgy, um, yeah, where, where do you go to find these things? Um, I've listed the known alienite examples. Uh, one thing that's pretty common with them is that they tend to be under national parks. Padinga isn't, um, but in South Australia, the Indigenous people have a lot of heritage sensitivities, so I'm not sure about that. And that's South Australia. I don't go there. They're, they're weird. So um, we, we had to find it ourselves. Um, so sampled Lake Hope in February 2021. Success on first hit. If you know what you're looking for, you, you know what you've got. Um, peg the ELA, the minimum necessary, eight blocks. Uh, that was granted January 2022. I had an expiration target, which, uh, which I did in Map Info because it's flat. You can grid things up. Did that in May 2022. Uh, and then we Impact Minerals, Martin actually found me on LinkedIn and um, Impact came knocking around. Uh, October 2022, and we uh, sealed the deal. Uh, and then the resource was prepared soon after that. So that that was, you know, I suppose a year and a half from grant, um, which is good um, as far as expiration goes. Um, in terms of, like, the way I look at it, it it's pretty easy to, to figure out the, uh, the expiration potential. This is just West Australian examples. There's 394 candidate lakes that I've identified. They range from 0.1 to 8 square kilometres. Um, a lot are under conservation estate. Some of them are logistically very difficult, um, very far from town. We, I know of, of 11 to date. I won't, won't say where. 
obviously. Um, there's three resources in the state. Two of them are player one stroke impact. Um, there's an existing resource on Lake Chandler that exists. Um, so I think there's potential in some of the larger lakes, which may or may not be under conservation estate, um, there's potential for 10 million tonnes of value night. Um, the known examples are between one and six metres, six metres being Lake Chandler, um, which is unusual. Most of them are about one to one and a half metres thick. So taking the one metre isopack in the area of the lake in square kilometres and the SG, you can get a thumb suck on the size, and, and I've put the anonymous lakes here, um, and their, their size potential on, fits that line. Um, the grade, obviously, uh, if it's above 24%, pushes them up in the contained alumina stakes. So th this gives you an idea of what's out, what potentially could be out there. Um, there's a lot of um, pitfalls with alienite exploration, not least of which is having to walk eight kilometres through very thick bush around Norseman to take one sample. Um, but, you know, some of the, you have to go out and sample because there can be a, a centimetre of, um, of sand over the top of some of these and they'll have good quality alienite below it. You just got to drill. Um, I think I've more or less gone through the project trajectory previously, um, but, you know, scoping study came out um, mid-2023. We did bulk sampling, you can see here, the, uh, what, the bulk sampling occurring on Lake Hope um, in, that was October, November last year. Um, so it's a summer act, it's a summer job. Um, we did some QAQC drilling going into our MRE update. You can ask Mike when that's coming out. Um, and we've just put in the mining lease application, PFS is underway. Um, the resource was about 185,000 bucks for 880 kilotons in contained alumina. That's $24 billion ish or more if you take um, Alpha HBA's current prices. 80% um, of the resource currently is in indicated category. Um, hopefully, there'll be an upgrade to measured for that. That's the plan. Uh, it has strong lateral con continuity. Um, we Drilled it with hand auger, PVC push tube, and mechanical push tube, and I'll get into that in a second. Um, yeah, we got nine additional prospective lakes under tenure ready to go. Um, the development plan at the moment is to dig 50 to 60 kilotons per annum. That's about two to three Olympic swimming pools per annum. Three dig, open cut, um, panel retreat mining in the summer months only uh, when it's dry enough that you're not going to get a little bit bogged on the surface, um, deliver the ore to a ROM pad off the lake lined with PVC to stop the salty water getting into the groundwater, uh, truck it to Quinana, process it into HPA at 10 kilotons per annum, um, make some fertiliser byproducts and backload the waste to site. Um, so in terms of auger drilling, um, metre, metre and a half, you can see our uh, Craig, a very experienced fieldy here, um, drilling half metre samples. Um, the, you've got a screw auger, so that splits it into two. You can take half from one side, half from the other. Um, if you need to do a duplicate, um, you scrape the tarp clean in between holes um, and about 45 minutes a hole. Uh, PVC push tube, pretty simple. Uh, get a one metre length of PVC from Bunnings, my favourite store. Um, put a cap on the end to help, help preserve the, the drill rod um, against the drill rig. That, that was rig one. We, Martin busted rig one um, in, our, in May. Um, and that can, you can extract a, a pretty intact sort of 25, 30, some, we actually got a 50 centimetre core out of one of them um, in one go. So you're producing core. Um, here's uh, Harry uh, doing a quarter core sampling with a knife. Uh, we did this because we had eight Ks to walk back with the sample. <laughs> uh, and in hiking terms, grams become kilograms, kilograms became, become tonnes. So... Um, and then the mechanical push tube is a fence post driver over a steel um, 
drill rod, 1.1 metres long, and inside of which you've got a plastic sleeve, um, and you can get a metre of intact core unless it pinches off like you see here, which happens from time to time. Um, and then you've got to jack it out with a rejack. Um, yeah, and that, that's, um, yeah, that, that's the drilling that we've achieved, uh, about 300 holes so far. So there, there's been some challenges, very interesting challenges with this project, one of which is that we've got about 650 samples total in the resource. So we were adding two standards per 100. We didn't even get to a statistically meaningful um, level of standards for each standard, right? We had 15 of each um, to determine whether the lab was giving us the right results on the standard. So we had to go back and do some um, extra push tube drilling to um, twin some holes and provide extra CRMs, extra duplicates, right? Moisture is about 14%, um, no seasonal variation, which you'd think wouldn't be right, but we've drilled five campaigns and they're all about 14%. Uh, the moisture is present as a hypersaline brine in between the alunite particles. And that contains almost all of the sodium. There's a bit in the alunite um, and it contains almost all of the magnesium and some sulfate. Uh, doing LOI is an absolute headache to figure out of your LOI. What is the sulfur versus the water? What amount of water is coming from the brine and what's coming from the um, loosely bound water on the alunite and what's coming from the crystalline water in the alunite and how much chlorine is coming out in your LOIs to affect your LOIs, 3% chlorine, right? So that's been a headache. The SG has been a headache too. Um, Gas Picno will tell you the SG of the particles once you've um, dried it out, but that's not good for the in situ. So, and you can't, rely on the density of the dried particles because you've got biotubation from spiders that live on the lake. Um, so I resorted in one uh, attempt of getting SG was to cut cubes out of the mud with a spatula in the heat of summer um, and then take them to the lab and get them wax coated and do an SG and that worked quite well. Um, so yeah, the, the SG Again, no, no seasonal variation apart from in the top five centimetres, which gets wet in winter. So that's an interesting... Um, there's been an interesting set of challenges, getting the methodology right so that we can pass muster for a measured resource, documenting things properly. Because um, it's a it's an unusual project, and so people are going to ask a lot of questions. Uh, in terms of the geochemistry, this is a much... This is an old... Um, map of Westlake alumina that I did from our um, drilling pre-impact. So all of this has been re released previously, nothing, nothing spicy. Um, <clears throat> we do have a large amount of it notionally, is about above 27%. Um, there is a slight stratification with iron, the lower Parts of the alienite are a percent higher in iron, half a percent higher in iron. Calcium is 0.07%. Phosphorus is 580 ppm. No manganese, 0.2% magnesium. All well, that's in the brine. You can wash out most of that if you wash the mud. 3% sodium. Again, most of that can be washed out. 23% sulfur, 21% silica. Bit of fluorine, but as we've learned previously, the fluorine isn't a problem in the metallurgy because it doesn't cook out in the, um, we don't calcine it to 900 degrees. Um, very interesting is about 20 ppm rare earths. So the, the process of forming the alunite excludes rare earths to most degrees. Um, here also compared to your volcanic deposits, there's less than a ppm of arsenic which forms a, um, a, a, a um, what's the word I'm looking for? That, that forms a sulfate intermediate salt that can carry through the um, metallurgy. So having no arsenic and working in sulfuric acid is important. Chrome as well, you can form 
a, um, a chrome alum uh, that at 2 ppm is much lower than the um, Fanshan deposit, which was a couple of hundred ppm. Uh, and vanadium as well, that can be a, a problem. Um, the mineralogy, we'll get into this a bit later, but it's about 62% alienite, 21% silica as amorphous silica. Bit of halite, almost no gypsum, uh, bit of detritals. Um, here's a, a few maps of some of the old drilling. This has been infilled since then, and we've also drilled up in the northern, the gooseneck we call it. Um, but you can see the alumina concentrates in the centre of the lake. The sulphur concentrates with the alumina in the centre of the lake, and because this is a potash alum, so too does the potassium. The LOI, which is tied to the sulphur and the water, also follows the alumina. But the, it's, um, the silica is depleted. So there's a relationship of effectively sulphur versus silica in these, um, in these salt lakes. And that's about it. Um, Martin is a wonderful statistician, and he's been unable to form any other relationship out of this stuff geochemically. Uh, in terms of the geochemistry, um, on the right here, we have some anonymous lakes, which I have data for. Uh, the green is the GSWA Lacustrine database from Wakem. Um, one of the questions was, uh, oops, sorry, I'll go back, uh, was could you have predicted this mineralisation existed from Wakem? No, not really. Um, so alienite salts are controlled by sulphate accumulation, but gypsum accumulation is separate from the alienite accumulation. And you can see that there, that we've got high, sorry, high sulphur, but no potassium. And potassium also, is, you can use alumina. Uh, the lowest grade, subgrade lake that we found um, here in purple is dominated by silica and kaolin and minor alienite. And then the best stuff is alienite, silica and minor kaolin. So, um, yeah, when you have sulphur over silica, you get good alienites. And looking at that graph, it's an either or. It either forms or it doesn't, really. Um, yeah, so I, I doubt you could have teased these out. Um, some more diagrams as a, as a way of trying to sort of get the geochemists interested. Um, this is calcium over sulphate, and it's logarithmic, by the way. So um, most of your sediments are roughly equal. So not a lot of calcium and not a lot of sulphur. Your gypsum is sitting up there. Most of your sediments are there, and then your alienites have got very little calcium and they all sit well away from everything else because the gypsum is depleted by ablation. Here we, on the east, sorry, on the right-hand side, potassium versus the sulphur over silica. You've got a, a trend from your sediments. Gypsum all sits up in that corner over there and your alienites sit there. Interestingly enough, a lot of it seems to be quite high-quality aeolian quartz sand, which... Um, you could probably go and explore for sand if you want. Um, in here, it's, it's like these uh, are on the x-axis is effectively potassium, aluminium and sulphate, which is percent alienite versus sulphur over silica. And here you can see your uh, sulphate sediments that you do have in the database are very low in terms of notional contained alunite and what we've got here in terms of East Lake and West Lake um, and some of the other lakes um, are up to 60% alunite. So that's a good, handy thing. Um, and, there, and on the right-hand side, again, your gypsum is off by itself. Um, and you'll note there are a few samples from West Lake sitting up in this field those are actually bits of the um, granite that we've drilled with a PVC tube um, into the saprolite underneath West Lake. So that's why they're sitting up there. Um, mineralogy, we've got 100 odd XRD analyses, 12% of the database, which is pretty good. Um, it's showing 53, 63% alunite, 10 to 18% amorphous, 5 to 12% kaolin, 12 to 20% quartz, 
no jarosite and no girthite. So the to this date, the exact phase where iron is sitting in this lake is unknown and it's possibly nanoscale amorphous iron hydroxides. Um, but the amorphous return on the XRD is likely a sulfate mineral. Um, it correlates with sulfur. Uh, and you can see here the percentage of alunite concentrates in the centre of the lake with your sulfur assays, your alumina and your potassium assays. Uh, here's an SEM of the mud. Um, there's a couple of crystals that are trigonal scalenohedrons, so, which is a, a, a trigonal habit. So that shows that it is alunite. Um, and that, that's the scale bar down here. That's two microns. So these are like 0.3 of a micron across. And that's the biggest that we've found. And some of these particles are just tiny. So it's also interesting to think that the kaolinite in here is the same grain size. It is neoformed. It's not actually alteration of felspar. This is kaolinite forming in situ in, as a salt lake, which was a, a question that Walid Salama had a few months ago. Um, and there's a you know a couple of little detrital minerals. Uh, the halide in these images here is is growing out of the mud because the mud was wet when it was put into the SEM and the uh, vacuum pulled the, the water out and formed the, the halite crystals. So these are just growing out of the um, the brine that's in the pore waters. Now uh, here's a SEM EDS uh, mapping of some of the alunite, there's yeah, not much to say, is there? Uh, it's effectively uniform. Uh, you, you, you can't tell where the iron's sitting compared to the alumina. It's all just back in the background, apart from the, there's the odd detrital silicate grain hanging out in there. So, yeah, my final thoughts is, um, yeah, I, I didn't start out to know a lot about salt lakes but I, do, I now do, and I didn't start out to know a lot about um, making HBA from alunite, but I now do. The learning curve has been pretty brutal compared to some of the other projects I've, I've worked on, but um, yeah, I hope you've learned enough to be dangerous out there uh, in the salt lakes, and um, yeah, definitely a, a summer sport. Um, and yeah, that, that's it. Any questions?